and we're live. Good evening, everyone. Today is Wednesday, August 17th, 2022. It is 5.01 p.m. I just missed being five o'clock on the dot. I will not blame the Google Glo Blue Go Live button. It was cooperating with me, but today we are joined by Rachel Vinman and Ben. And well, it is a pleasure to have Rachel Vinman back yes. on the show. The last time she was here, I believe there was one dog. His name, if memory serves, was Ace Vinman. <laughs> yes, we actually have we have an, an older dog. She just doesn't make much of an appearance because she kind of sleeps all the time. So I see. So this is this is Loki is is dog number three. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, we're really quite crazy. Yes. Yes. No, my I husband. Didn't. My husband's in Ukraine, so I'm like he's like <laughs> skating out. He literally went to a war zone to miss the first week of having a puppy, which is like the hardest week. Yeah, it so. is hard. That crying, the midnight, like, right. yeah, training. yeah, he called oh. me when he woke up, which um, I just like the puppy had just woken up. So it was like kind of like midnight ish here. We texted and I was awake. And he was like, I'm going to have to let you go. I can't stand because I put him back in the crate. And he was like, I can't stand the whining. So this is he has no stomach for it. He's not strict War zone all. over puppy wine. Yeah, wow. I, love that. I know. <laughs> Air so raid sirens. We've got we've got a lot to talk about tonight, um, but I would be remiss if I did not start out by saying that we are not allowed to have fun anymore. Um, but we are allowed to have Rachel Vinman and uh, Tim Miller's going to show up <laughs> at some point. Um, uh, he's, you know, as you can imagine, very heavily booked today, but he agreed to stop by. Uh, so um, before we get started, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, I have tweeted some not so nice things about USAA and their handling of uh, my cabin, uh, which is now being uh, literally destroyed by um, demolding people who are uh, um, uh, going to be paid for uh, not by USAA. <laughs> um, uh, but I was, uh, we were, Rachel and, and Genevieve and I were talking before the show and uh, and she had a better experience with USA, not perfect, but a little better. And so in the interests of fairness and hearing all points of view <laughs> on In Lieu of Fun, I wanted to uh, ask her to tell this story, particularly because I promise you, it will make you laugh. <laughs> so um, in 2019, on June 6th, or June 7th, the day after Alex's birthday, we realized we had, we were in the basement and we realized there was a little bit of a leak. So the follow it was a Friday. So the following week, someone came and <clears throat> first they're just going to like, you know, bring their fans or whatever. And I was sitting on the front porch and someone came out and the, and the guy said, ma'am, I don't think you need water remediation. You need mold remediation. I was like, what are you talking about? And he was like, come in, let me show you. So basically we had a dishwasher leak and they had put tile over two layers of linoleum. So the dishwasher leaked a little bit each time and then linoleum let it spread. So I'm lucky that I wasn't like cooking dinner one day and just fell through to the basement because it was completely rotten, but it went okay. Um, we had to move out because of mold remediation and we had to move to my brother-in-law. They live four doors down, Alex's twin to their basement. So we're living in their basement and I mean, they're lovely people. I do like them, but it was a little close for comfort and, um, You're still in a basement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I was. And so I would call Alex that, that summer and you know, I'm like, what are you doing? What is more important than getting us moved back into our house and getting our kitchen fixed? And I would literally say those words. And then, um, so as you know, the summer of 2019, there was a lot going on at, with him at work. And then- oh, wait, just to be clear, this is the summer of 2019. Yes. And he can't talk about it. No, no, no. Classified right. I mean, right? he was, 
he never really seemed that busy um, or the particularly <laughs> stressed. Like, he didn't act like it was any big deal. So when I read Ambassador Taylor's opening statement, he had a lot of dates in there. It was very factual. And when I read it, I, I remember calling to friends and I said, all I can think of is, oh, my goodness, I was harassing Alex uh, almost on a daily basis about getting this. And then I matched up the dates and I realized he was very busy that summer trying to figure out what was going on. And I guess so keep he, things was, on he was like trying. He was like trying to prevent the president from extorting yeah. the president. Basically, and, yeah. And you were like, what have you got yeah, that's more I important There's than our There's nothing basement? more important. It turns out there was like maybe democracy or not like <laughs> extorting my, my, perhaps the only thing that was more important, um, but it was. <laughs> and then when, so another funny part to this, we moved back into the house and we had been away for a wedding and it was Rosh Hashanah and but like the back of our house, everything was gone. So everything was moved up to the front. It looked like an episode of Hoarders. And uh, we get back to our house after being out. And Greg Miller from WAPO shows up at our house. And this was like still before anyone knew who Alex was. He had put all the pieces together and he came to talk to us. And Alex was like, very polite. You need to leave. And I was like, but where's the phone number? I want to call him and tell him about the kitchen so he doesn't think that we're an episode of Porters. Because if you just open our door, it was awful. It was humiliating. I mean, there was stuff everywhere. And it was all shoved to the front half of our house. So, And so um, have you ever had that conversation with Greg? I have, yes, actually. Good, Greg, good. I love that. Yeah, that's we, the kind of thing that weighs on you over a long period <laughs> yeah, of time. No, like every I mean, time you see his byline, yes, you're like, absolutely. Like, what like, must oh he think goodness. of us? Yes, <laughs> it, it kind of, it was, it was, it was crazy. But this, it was not, um, everything was not set until uh, like almost New Year's of that year. It took a very long time to, uh, so it was like from June to, to New Year's and almost seven full months. And uh, the workers were downstairs. So Alex and I were upstairs working on his, like the first, um, his opening statement going over every single word. Um, oh my like, God. It, and I remember they were like hammering downstairs and it was just, I don't know. I, I just people really... always forget that um that like people's normal lives yeah have to no. go on in the middle yes, of this stuff yes i mean there was no suspension of like uh, you know of, of everything and then like even the workers were like oh my gosh it's like you're you because they would come in <laughs> right. like the next couple of days and all of a sudden we were you know it was it was completely different it was very surreal i mean it still is when the, i think about the it the pipe that's about to burst doesn't actually say well maybe i'll wait till next <laughs> yeah week yeah I mean. because like rachel's got a lot going on right yeah, now yeah, um, I wish. that's like yeah. not part of the internal mm -hmm. monologue of mm -hmm, the pipe mm -hmm. yeah. um the guy who um uh, uh uh mows the lawn at the cabin in the woods uh uh recently asked my wife whether uh he whether her husband was the guy he keeps hearing bad <laughs> things about on fox news <laughs> and i thought like i'd like to keep this a little separate yeah, you know, I know you, yeah. you mow the lawn we, we write yeah. your check yeah and, yeah 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 no i mean it, i also didn't point. know that until he asked i didn't know that fox news was talking about me very uh, much but apparently so so new puppy yes 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 i can i can get my let's talk bring him up here okay yeah let's so see. i i have a question how did sure. you so i know how i came to the name loki because we share yeah. now a yeah, loki yeah. dog how did you name your loki dog we were on vacation um in europe for we kind of tagged along alex had some work and we had and then we we were gone for a long time but we went to a lot of museums and um, saw a lot of Greek and Roman statues. And so we were like very into the Greek and Roman God names. And none of those really seemed to fit. And because, you know, when you have a dog or a cat, you kind of an animal, you kind of always like 
end up making their name end in Y or some sort of version. So Very true. then, you know, I mean, we're like kind of thinking, what would the nickname be or whatever? So then we said Loki. And I was like, what does Loki mean? I'm like, it's the god of mischief and a Norse god. And then we were in Scotland, actually, when we told our daughter, because we were kind of trying to keep it a secret, but Alex was going to be gone this week. So those plans are kind of, they were evolving. So then he wanted to at least see her face when we told her. And, you know, Scotland is quite primitive and, you know, sort of very prehistoric looking, I guess, what I would think of like a Norse uh, mm-hmm. god sort of thing. So, I mean, it all kind of fit. Yeah. And that's where we are. So far, though, he's not um, he's not too crazy, but he's been here less than um, less than 24 hours. So it's but certainly remains to be seen. Just long enough to make Alex want to go to a war. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, he just totally knew what it was going to be like. Oh, it's, yeah. It's, 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 you know, how it is. It's a lot of crying. And, and how is uh, uh, is Ace handling it? Uh, he wants to hurt him. Um, he's a, Ace is a German Shepherd, uh, Australian Shepherd Bic. So he definitely wants to keep him in line. But he's tolerant and patient. Our older dog is like, nope. No, no, no. Oh, I see Tim is here. Um, so she's like, nope, none of that. I'm not interested. And um, I mean, so, you know, she's older and kind of cranky and set in her ways. And Ace is like bouncy and he's two and a half and he has a lot of energy. And um, and then we have a baby and that might actually mirror the humans in our family as well. <laughs> and I will totally own up to being the oldest member of the family and maybe the crankiest. <laughs> hey Tim, do you have a puppy? No, I don't. Uh, I don't like dogs. Actually, don't tell anybody. This is a secret podcast, right? <laughs> um, I, this is. is do oh people do people know sure about this? Is this on one? video? Um, yeah, I know. I just sorry. I don't know. I like humans and okay. the dogs. I, they smell, they lick me and they smell a little bit. And I think we're gonna tweet out that Tim Miller doesn't <laughs> like dogs. No. Um, okay. This is a secret. So I people, have a, people really get mad at you when you don't like dogs. They, you know. But do dogs they, like they, you? They judge if they you. They lick you. I don't. I don't know. I can't get inside their head. That's one of the reasons I don't like dogs. I don't know what they're thinking. I can't rationalize with them. <laughs> How do we see, feel, I feel about that way cats? with the GOP these days? <laughs> <laughs> How do we feel about cats, though, Tim? They're fine. I don't dislike them. They don't lick me or smell as much. <laughs> I did get bit by a cat one time, though. That kind of scared me. Uh, so, so I'm not just, I'm not really not a big animal person. I don't mind yeah. zoos. I can watch. I like to look at them. You know, <laughs> the big cats. I find big cats cool to watch. But pets, yeah, I like big cats a lot. I'm not really a pets person. So it's the invasion of the personal space is what I'm hearing. Yeah. When I was in when I was in Singapore a few years ago for a, 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 the Pacific Command conference, um, Singapore many problems with it as a society. Yeah, all that jazz. It has the coolest zoo in the world. Uh, yes, we've been. Isn't really? it amazing? Tell me more. So the the it, night zoo. Or the night did zoo. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so it was incredible. It, it is. The theory of it is that all of the animals are more active at night, so you should go to the zoo at, at night. Mm-hmm. And you go through it on a kind of tram. Mm-hmm. And um, and my son and I were there. Uh, the, the part of it that was most fascinating to us, we just stood there and watched them. It's this tiny little wild cat called a fishing cat. Mm-hmm. And they stand at the bank of the water, like mm-hmm. stock still and fish school around it and then it just goes bam and like drags out the fish uh and watching them hunt uh it's like you know like watching bears in in um in uh you know on bear cam and Mm -hmm. uh hunt salmon only in miniature it's like a you know and it's it's hilarious and it's really impressive and they're about this little bigger than house cats, but not much. Uh, and I thought, uh, you know, I have no idea why I'm telling this story, but I was very impressed. Try to get me to like animals, I think. No, I, maybe. <laughs> so, or just that zoos are cool. It's a great zoo. It's the best zoo I've ever been to. We went a long time ago, but um, 
it, it's it's quite impressive. And Singapore is far more tolerable at night weather wise than it is yeah. in the day. So and it's it's probably the best food town in the world. <laughs> it's a great place. So I'm gonna um, re I'm gonna repeat myself and say, speaking of things that I can't get inside the mind of everybody, the news cycle is also something that does not wait for mold or staggering stories or anything that it just all happens at once, it seems. So how's everyone dealing and what's everyone's favorite current event story right now? <laughs> yeah, so so Tim, get us started. How are you feeling? Uh uh, in the post Cheney era, <laughs> I'm feeling pretty good. I don't know. I mean, uh, Donald Trump is under multiple investigations, as best as I can tell. Don't hate that. Rudy's under some investigation. Don't hate that at all. Um, you know, Liz Cheney's loss. Uh, I saw that coming. Uh, you know, uh, that was not as a big. <laughs> that was not a big <laughs> devastating moment for me. I've. I've Knowing this was going to happen for a long time, so I was mentally and physically prepared. I did not cry, uh, though she almost got me at the end of her stirring concession speech last night um, and her appeal to the American people and the free people and to our, our power in the face of wannabe tyrants. Uh, so I thought that was, that was uh, you know, expected. Um, I, I think that if you come to today's news cycle with the mindset of I'm really hoping that the Republican Party is going to go back to normal, a party that I liked, a party that I was maybe part of, a party that, that I felt like was a, a valiant opponent to me as a, as a liberal who cares about the constitutional order. So if, if that is your view, this is, this is a rocky news cycle for you, you know, watching the Republicans uh, uh, rally to the defense of a criminal and throw overboard Liz Cheney for the crime of not being a, uh, uh, a fervent enough cultist. Um, I, I did not come to the news cycle with that view. <laughs> I've, I've long felt that, um, that the Republican Party is not redeemable in the short term, uh, that the water is contaminated, and that um, you know we need to create a broad alliance in favor of democracy and mm -hmm. defeat them before anything can get be better. Uh, and if you're coming to the news cycle from that perspective, the news has been pretty good this week. Rachel, how are you feeling about the news? I, I mean, it, it's I definitely the um, news from last week was, uh, as Tim said, it was quite heartening. I mean, I, I think, you know, we, we see some movement um, and I hope that it will be sustained. I think that's the way DOJ works. Once they kind of open up the can of worms, then um, don't tend to go back. So I think that's positive. But, uh, you know, the rhetoric just keeps getting worse and worse. And I mean, as we talked, I guess, when I was here before, it's just something that concerns me because I, I don't think, I think a lot of the threats are empty threats, but not all of the threats are empty threats. And I think a lot of it is, you know, a call to to violence and some people, even if it's a few people, I mean, it's it's on the margins, you know, my act. And that concerns me um, for maybe our own personal safety, but also for, for a lot of people. We've already seen, you know, those who have been activated. And then, you know, I texted my brother yesterday and I, I don't even like to say something about Herschel Walker because I feel as if I'm making fun of someone who is you know, mentally unstable and perhaps intellectually um, challenged. Uh, it, it's the weirdest thing that they're willing to put up this person that I don't even have words to describe him. I'd like to hear Tim talk about Herschel Walker. Um, but yeah, that, that situation. It's so sad. It's so I mean, sad. It's, it's close, which is alarming. But I assume people aren't even listening on his site, aren't listening to him. That's that's how I can sort of explain that. But just that someone's like, oh, yeah, this is a good idea. I mean, he's even more mentally unstable than Donald Trump, which is who knew that was possible. <laughs> and also, Harry Hagman, get, is that her name? Harry what's going Hagerman? on with her? Yeah. Hey, what's going on with her eyes? <laughs> what's the it's, uh, it's, I, it's I, terrifying. I, 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 
I don't she's watch scary. TV. I only see, hear them when oh, I. Oh, I mean, I see your pictures. I just think she's terrifying. And the words she says, she believes it. I mean, you have these idiots like Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene. I don't think they actually believe this stuff. They just say it because it's like red meat. But I think she unfortunately believes all the conspiracy theories, don't you? No, no. You Harriet's don't? eyes. Oh, okay. no, Harriet's eyes are the eyes of somebody that has been consumed by the devil. Uh, Harriet <laughs> okay. went down to the crossroads, and the you know the ugliness inside her is starting to seep out. I think into wow. her uh, Got a public Robert business. Johnson reference there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> she uh, Harriet Hageman was on a conference call with me actually about let's see what month are we in August? So you know about what five years ago, six years ago this time um, when she was planning a coup. Yeah, at the convention to That's to have Do- Ted Cruz defeat uh, Donald Trump. Um, yeah. She's a little crazy then, uh, but uh, uh, earnest so- social conservative, and did not want Donald Trump to corrupt the party. And you know, now she ran a campaign completely based on making Donald Trump an unelected autocrat. So uh, I-, I think that she has, um, you know, just been embodied by her worst demons and and i think that maybe like that it's given her like an eye twitch and which character and not a doctor your, which character in your <laughs> book is she uh if, which character if, is Har- uh, harriet oh she's yeah. Elise. she's a least okay so yeah, so <laughs> yeah. inhabited yeah, by so you think it's all for real not not a calculated no no elise isn't for real elise stefanik not caroline caroline oh i'm sorry the cult. I'm elise stefanik no, she's elise stefanik no it's a pure ambition and recognition that she can get everything that she wants as long as she's willing to uh you know sell her soul to donald trump and so say- she's chosen to do that okay let's talk for a minute about Would you Sarah say that Cameron. carrie lake is a caroline Boy, well, Carrie Lake is an interesting case. I'd like to spend a little time with her. I wish I don't know I don't that she wants to be happen. around me. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it's going to happen <laughs> soon. Yeah, I don't think so. But I, I would like to like go to Tulum with her and do some margaritas <laughs> and just kind of like understand what's happening <laughs> underneath there because she has taken a astonishing turn. I mean, she was like I know I know the old Carrie Lake because as a gay man, we all know the old Carrie Lake. She was the married lady that shows up to the drag brunch, has one too many cocktails, like starts dancing with you. And you're like, you know, this is really still a gay space. Okay, Carrie, you're getting a little too, you're a little too into us. It's fine. We welcome everyone to come. Invasion of the personal space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is still our space here. Uh, and uh, but there's always one mom. Uh, sorry, it's just usually mom. This isn't sexism, it's, okay. it's just a trend. It's usually I just moms. like to stay it's home, not, so it'll never, yeah, be it's me. not usually dad, <laughs> straight dads, it's usually straight me. dads that show up to the gay brunch. Yeah, something yeah. else going on, there's something <laughs> else going on there. Um, uh, but uh, the straight moms they just want to be around us, so I know her. So for her to now go into being like, we need to drone the border. And like keep the homosexual groomers out of schools and like make Donald Trump a God King. Uh, it's hard to know whether that is a carol, like whether she's been sucked into a cult or whether she's like a sociopath and, and is just able to completely dissociate or, or whether something has happened in her life. You know, maybe a liberal touched her in the wrong place and she just flipped. I don't, uh, the psychology of Carrie Lake is tougher for me to understand because it's just so. Tr- and it's so dramatic. It's like and, unbelievable. And sort of it's unbelievable. Sudden. And sudden, right. Yeah. Harriet Eggman was always kind of like a little kooky conservative, right? Whatever. So it was this the step over the line was a much easier step for her to rationalize. I can understand how she was rationalized. And I don't obviously don't support it anyway. I find it despicable, but I can understand it. The Carrie Lake thing is much more confusing. I mean, she was a Obama mom at the mm-hmm. gay bar drinking you know saying hey girl hey and like now she wants to start droning people <laughs> i mean it's, maybe a, it was too much it's an alarming spice. change what maybe it was too much spunk, <laughs> pumpkin spice i think there's a maybe it was too much that's... pumpkin spice now that's as good a theory as any i mean uh, also the reference to bde is just she doesn't know what that is <laughs> if she's assigning it to the individuals that she's assigning it to that was I, I so also weird think that that, that I just on a on a tangent on the BDE thing. I just think that there's a um, there we've crossed a moment when conservatives 
are using that vocabulary right? and introducing it into our political society. I mean, like it, it, it'd be one thing if, you know, if this were some kind of, you know, uh, a left progressive mm -hmm. thing, you know, that's kind of, but for them to be, for this to be coming out of the social conservative world, um, just, it just seems a little, uh, I don't know. And then she told somebody to ask their kids what it meant, which I thought was uh, like a weird touch. So who's the groomer now? Yeah, uh, right? She, I don't think she's not a social conservative, though. She's not a social conservative. She used to be a drag king. <laughs> she's a TV show host. Like, she's not a social. So that's why she's able to do this. Um, anyway, yeah. it's, a, it's, a weird, it's a weird time we're in. It's All right. Very weird. So um, let's talk about Sarah Palin. I will confess <laughs> oh, that I am unable to interpret the election results in Alaska from last night because I do not adequately understand the new Alaska mm -hmm. electoral system. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, do either of you have a sufficient understanding of how the uh f f top four uh system works to have a sense of whether uh sarah palin is is coming to washington because i don't want her here rachel uh, i have no idea I, I the problem i think with like the is it was it ranked choice or something was it, is that what they it's a weird version yeah, of ranked uh, choice. i feel like this is really I wanted to put Rachel on the spot there just as a joke. I kind I, of understand. I have no it. idea. I, I read about it. I've read about it a lot. What, what the problem is, is like, I don't think the voters understand. So I think when you change this in the middle of something, it's really a disservice to all voters. But I read about it all last week because uh, they had a lot of like education stuff in, and I was stuck in Oklahoma, so I didn't have much to do. And I was reading about it. And then I, I, I was trying to read about it yesterday as well like as the results are coming out i think it's very confusing but tim you probably do understand it i don't really i partially understand it a key element that, that to understand is that there were two elections happening simultaneously yeah, in the house right. then she was on both one was a special election mm -hmm. to fill the seat that uh, don young had died and the other one then is to for the was the primary for the permanent seat mm -hmm. which the general election will be held in november so on the primary, Sarah Palin has already made it into the top four. It's a rank, it's a jungle primary rank choice top four. So that means that all people from all parties, including somebody named Santa Claus, put their name on the ballot, and the top four participants make it to then the general election in November, which is then determined via the rank rank choice system. So it's a jungle plus rank choice. Uh, meanwhile, they were in the second round of the special election. Sarah was in second place behind the Repu behind the Democrat in that one. Third place was like your Glenn Youngkin Republican, for just lack of a better, you know, uh, Whose vantage name point. Is Begich used to be the Democratic they, senator? <laughs> right. So, but they, are they related? Or I don't believe they, so. So it's just randomly they both have the same political names a lot of baggage in alaska baggage is like smith up there you just don't you know everybody's a baggage um, interesting so, is that because they you go down to the grocery store and it's like baggage baggage during, yeah, during the neolithic era yeah yeah there was a norseman named baggage um no <laughs> I, I really have no idea um so <laughs> palin is in second in that now they go to the ranked choice voting but like this is going to take literally a month. You've got to, all the ballots got to come in via snow dog from like the great <laughs> north. And, you know, like Todd Palin's on the back of some dogs going mush, mush. he's supporting Begich. Yeah, he's, he's not staring, supporting which, Sarah. I, I, I thought, by the way, that's like uh, awesome. Uh, his family had a election night watch party for Begich, which I thought so was uh, like classy. He can go yeah. pick him up in his his uh, plane that lands on water. He can go pick up the ballots all over the state. Exactly. So anyway, the main question is, do, do the Begich supporters 
are there is their second choice in the ranked choice voting going to be the Democrat or Palin? Um, and and uh, the Democrat is a little bit of an edge. So t- there's a chance that a Democrat wins that uh, seat, which would be a House pickup, but only for two months. And then they're, they're up again in the general election. The and whole so thing what, is, the whole the thing is general election. The general election, though, is uh, the she same has, <laughs> it's the same people. So why are we yeah. assuming the general election is different just because this was a a jungle primary for that yeah well because the date like people more people probably will turn out to vote in november the the makeup of the electorate will be different so we already had the jungle primary for the special so we're in round so simultaneously on the ballot was round one of uh, this is what i didn't understand general this is election mm-hmm. and round two of the special election or simultaneously on the same ballot mm. interesting um, it's ridiculous. All right. We can just say it. It's ridiculous. That's ridiculous because you shouldn't actually have a special election three months before the general election. For like, there should just be a rule that the governor can name somebody temporarily. And people just need to be able to count the votes. I mean, let's just, I, I love our ranked choice voting friends. I'm sure two people in the comment section are very passionate mm-hmm. ranked choice yeah. voting fans because there are a lot of them. But like, People need to understand the voting system and 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 all of us very educated people really struggling to navigate this like that is a sign of a, of a system that does not breed trust. I'm sorry. So the woman who um, uh, has promulgated this Alaska, uh, this top four system is a woman named Catherine Gale. Um, uh, uh, I'm not Gail Gill. I'm not sure how she pronounces it. G-E-H-L. And I know her a little bit. I think she's extremely impressive and she's like, it's a very well thought out system, but the fact that it takes, I I do think this is a kind of deep flaw in it. The fact that you can't count the votes in a timely fashion, the fact that it's pretty hard to understand and to get it working in a way that you don't have the primary the same day as the general Mm -hmm. for a a special election versus a regular election i think it's going to take some refinement yeah i mean you can start i mean it's not like it's not like calculus level confusing but it's a little confusing it's confused to older people who are trying to fill out the ballots Mm -hmm. and but it would help if they could figure out how to do it in a way that we count it in a day I just, this breeds mistrust, like the amount of time, like, and, and this happened in New York. It's not just because of Alaska, like New York city, all the mayor's race. And we, you know, we didn't know who won for days. And that's just, I, I we actually need to be able to don't under, a better system. I actually don't understand why it can't be instant in the sense that, you know, uh, you know, the idea of, IRV instant runoff voting has been around a long time that you know you check off your first and second choices and the tabulation has a round one and a round two in it I guess in Alaska it's because of you know the slow pace at which stuff comes in from remote areas but I never understood in New York why it took it's like there were like people going one, two, three mm-hmm. on the second round. And I'm just not sure I understand why that needs to happen. Maybe we can bring in John Hawkinson uh, from the comment section. He's, he's our, he's our resident passionate RCV person. <laughs> he can maybe answer that field, that question. I, I also don't know. So I, here's my question to you both. Um, we have, uh, the possible return of Sarah Palin, not certain by any means. We have the uh, defeat, not unexpected, as Tim says, we've priced it in of uh, of uh, Liz Cheney. Um, is there any reason at all to be hopeful about, uh, uh, you know, are, are we now in a situation in which, you know, 
we should just treat the two-party system as a pro and anti-democracy party? Um, or should we be making distinctions that says, hey, you know, may maybe Mr. Begich the, uh, is a fine guy. Maybe, uh, you know, uh, we should be sort of parsing distinctions among Republicans. Or should we simply be saying, hey, you know, they've had a lot of chances to uh, vote for the Hogan's and the Liz Cheney's and they just consistently refuse to do it on a, uh, I mean, Hogan's going to be replaced on the Republican ticket by an election denier um, uh, in Maryland. And we should basically just treat the Republican Party as, you know, whatever their positions on individual issues, the basic position is how they'll vote in the organizing resolution of their chamber. And it's an anti-democracy party, and that's all there is to it. Uh, so, Rachel, what do you think? Is there any, uh, you know, this gets into the sort of JVL, Sarah Longwell mm -hmm. debate, but I, I'm curious where you are on it. The more we go on, the less I see a chance that there's anything worth salvaging in the Republican Party. Uh, I used to think there was a chance. I understand that. And you're a former Republican, right? Yeah. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I voted. So I, I wasn't like, I, I was never really politically active. But uh, I mean, in terms of, you know, I never donated to a candidate or, or even worked on a campaign. I voted. Um, that was about it. But, you know, I mean, I, I guess I have some conservative views on some things, uh, not, not really socially, but uh, I just... I don't see how we can work with people. I mean, and you see the votes on the infrastructure or, uh, sorry, I'm not on the infrastructure, uh, on the, um, uh, the infl what is it? Sorry, Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it was just strict party lines and, it, and it, tell it just felt like they weren't thinking. They didn't even care. And it feels like everyone going back to their corners before November, showing their loyalty. It was really disappointing to me. And um, I'm embarking on a on a tour uh, to have some very small scale, I mean, like salons with suburban women and women in some, in some battleground states and talking to people. But I've had some initial discussions um, and and this is kind of the feedback. I had some discussions last week and some calls and and this is what people are saying. Like, it just seems sort of like to write it off. Anyone who is holding out hope, like it just doesn't exist anymore. I don't see how it's salvageable. I mean, and you see more and more people coming to that conclusion. Tim, what do you think? Is there any Republican anywhere on the ballot for whom you would vote? Oh, sure. Like a mayor's race or something mm -hmm. like local, um, like a governor in a blue state, maybe, um, you know, where the Democratic machine has become sclerotic, but not really. Here's how I try to explain it to people. And I think this is hard for people to wrap their head around, especially people my age and older. Um, and that is our whole lives, like the parties have been, you know, basically broken down on this left-right divide, right? Where right is smaller government, lower taxes, stronger military, you know, more social conservatism. You know, and left is social liberalism, you know, relatively a little less aggression and foreign policy and bigger government. And like, I just don't think that that is what the party's dividing line is right now. Like, there's no evidence that that is, you know, on a number of those issues, like it could be flipped now, that, that those are not the, none of those are the animating issues of the Republican Party of, of those three topics, social issues, uh, economic conservatism and 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 strong foreign policy, the, Republic, the Republican Party energy is actually most on the opposite of nationalist foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, on social issues, they're really, you know, it's more like these cultural, though I guess with abortion coming back in, now social conservative issues are coming back in, but really it was more about these cultural war issues than, you know, what we thought of traditionally as social issues. And they don't, get, they don't give a shit about uh, like market economics. So so that's not what the dividing line is anymore. And I think a lot of people who don't think they've changed their views 
on those three legged stool of Ronald Reagan, like think that the party will come back to that at some point and that it's worth fighting for. Like the reality is like that is not the dividing line between the parties anymore. Like the, the, the major salient issues of our time are like you're, you're talking about, about, you know, protection and preservation of democracy is one. And the other is on the culture war issues that are being stirred, um, you know, mostly by the right, in some cases in response to kind of the social justice activism that's happening on the left. Um, right. And that, that, that is what divides the two parties. And, and like, you know, just like back in the old days where immigration was like an issue that, like some Republicans had one view and, you know, it was actually more liberal than some Democrats. Like that is now the case with government size of government issues. So like the animating divide within the party has just have just changed. And I think that's hard for some people to come to terms with. Um, and so, you know, that that's kind of how I view things. Maybe it will that go on forever. No, like, but it's going to go on for a while. Can I ask you both just piggybacking on this briefly? Ben, go ahead. I think you're muted. Oh, you're bragging about yourself now? Okay, got it. I, I'm just going to leave this up here while you're talking, GDF, for, for him, <laughs> him to uh, boil in. Um, I, but, I, uh, still, I just don't necessarily think you're right. It's so uh, weird we're, that we're you're gonna doing, get a, to you're that doing after this victory GDF's, lap. We're going to get to Sorry. that after GDF's question. Oh, no problem. Okay, it'll be, I, I think, fairly brief. I just want to hear both of your opinions on what do you guys think would be the key message to people who really don't want to give up what they believe the Republican Party could be? Because I think a lot of the friction that at least I hear in personal conversations with people who are still Republican but aren't uncomfortable with a lot of the different things that are going on is that, well, you know, this is just temporary and it's very hard to communicate no, this way is risk of democracy as an institution, as a government, as a way of life. Pluralism is at risk, liberalism at risk. And how do you communicate that to the voter who perhaps really just believes in small government and as they coined it, fiscal responsibility? <laughs> uh, I would tell them, I would not make a positive argument to them. I would tell them that uh, I would make a, a clips list of Steve Bannon's podcast on the mm -hmm. war room. And I would tell them to listen to it. And I was like, I would like for you in order for us to maintain our friendship, my request, you can make a request for me of one hour of your time. I'm demanding you spend one hour listening to Steve Bannon's podcast and then spend another 30 minutes reading through all of Donald Trump's tweet truths. Okay. And then I would like for you to come back to me in 90 minutes and tell me where you are aligned with them. Uh, and I, I just, I think that like uh, the honest answer is they are living in this little bubble, which is, I'm sh assuming you're talking about urban dwelling people, which is who this usually is. It's like city dwelling, fiscally conservative people, you know, who want smaller government. Maybe they're small business owners or maybe whatever. They've had a bad experience with government. Okay. And they think that's what the Republican party is about. It. It's not, it's mm -hmm. not. And, and the people that, that control the party um, uh, have much different agenda uh, that I, I think that most of those people would be turned off by if they listen to an hour of Steve Bannon's podcast and they think, man, this guy's making a lot of sense. Well, then you can know that <laughs> we disagree now. Um, I just, I, I think that like a lot of people just, that is like a different universe from them. Right. And so they're like, I don't even, I don't even listen to that. Right. The only thing that a lot of these people, the only thing they hear are liberals. Right. I'm like, this liberal annoyed me. Something this liberal said annoyed me. And it's because they're not, they just aren't even living in that, in the ecosystem where all the Republican voters are living in. Force them to live over there for a little while. And, and, and maybe that, I think that's the most way, the best way to convince them of the threat. Because nothing that you say about pluralism or democracy, like that shit. Yeah. I, I completely agree with Tim. I mean, it's it's there. It's fanciful thinking. I mean, they they don't understand because they don't want to understand exactly the takeover of the party. The only way to fix it, it really has to be burnt down and started back up. And and we just that's not going to happen in one election cycle, one presidential election. It's going to be a very long time. So I guess they have. To they have to decide right now which side are they on. And it's not going back in two years or four years. It's, that's not going to be the timeline. So they really have to see it. <clears throat> and some people really do believe it. 
um, when I was in Oklahoma, I was asking someone, so what's the difference between you and other people? Like these, these are people who are always Republicans and, and they just despise Donald Trump and everything he stands for. And there's, it's like a flip of a coin. I mean, there's no way to even predict it. They were telling me people who were major Trumpers that I've known my whole life. These are like my parents' friends. And then others, it's it's very bizarre. I mean, it's like almost unpredictable. And I will tell you the political commercials in Oklahoma were truly unhinged. I, I mean, I would turn it really? off. It was like, I'm the Trumpiest. No, I'm the Trumpiest. And I mean, all the buzzwords, the bingo, like godless Democrats and woke and socialism <laughs> and communists and Nazis and all. I mean, it was, again, just like a bingo card of you don't to hear that hate and that vile. I, I can't be healthy, um, but but they are hearing it and they're just ignoring the reality and and the pervasiveness of it. Okay. All right. So I want to talk I, about this. I've story. got to go after this. Yeah. So if you have, if you want to talk, if you want to rub something in my face, this is no, your no, moment. No, no, no. Here's your chance. <laughs> I, I want to just remind everybody, without gloating at all, that when I posted this, Tim came on the show to mock me about it, <laughs> um, and uh, we had an hour-long debate. We did it in person. The gist of which was uh, in the Bulwark offices. The gist of which was, Ben, what are you smoking? To um, And so I just want to ask Tim how he's feeling about this tweet at this point. Uh, and also, uh, uh, and just get a little temperature uh, check on on Tim's uh, sense of things before. Okay, he I think that before, off. what we need to do is take that debate. And what I would like to do is put it into Rev. And before we like, come on next time, I would like to <laughs> to just re to look at my exact comments and see if I disagree if I would disagree with any of them now, because uh, I, I I do agree with this the candidates matter words in the tweet. Yeah, circumstances uh, too. That was a like a row reference. Yeah, I, I I don't I don't disagree with that. Here's the thing, I just I've I've had to suffer through a lot of these midterms. There is a pattern to them. Uh, yeah. Some strange things have happened this year, of course, with Roe, and uh, there are unusual things that have happened, but there is this pattern of, of out party, you know, things look really, really good. And then over the summer, you, people start to be like, well, maybe not quite as good. And then in the fall, people start to kind of break back against in favor of the out party. Like we've seen that trend now many times. So I before I, I wouldn't start gloating in August, I guess is what I would say. All right. I'm just, um, I still just think, that, I still think that the Democrats yeah. are going to win the House. My uh, gun to my head, I still would say that the Democrats, excuse me, that the Republicans take the House, and gun to my head, I would still say that the Republicans will take the Senate, which I think is a contrary view, right Ooh. now. I don't yes. know. I, I think it's close, though. I, I think I, I would, and I, and I, I have adjusted my priors slightly to. I think the Democrats have a better chance of controlling the Senate than I would have thought, probably when you sent that tweet. Um, but uh, mostly because of the candidates matter part of it. So we'll see. Um, you know, I also, and I don't want to be a poll truther, but. I'm deeply skeptical of summer polls in Wisconsin. Like there's one that has Mandela Barnes up seven today. I think Mandela yeah. could win. I, I don't think it's impossible that he wins, but I, I just, I think that imagine your head, your median Trump voter in Green Bay. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that he's answering polls in August. Mm -hmm. I really, mm -hmm. I really don't. And I think that there, and I think that it's tough for pollsters right now to deal with that. There's just this college, you know, now that we've polarized educationally, who <laughs> are more likely to answer these phones. So um, anyway, I'm still a little bit of a rain cloud uh, on on November, but uh, but we'll see. Let's. I mean, I, I hope I hope to be I hope to be surprised. I hope the sun peeks through my rain cloud, and I would love to come <laughs> back on November 9th or whatever it is, and just have you dunk on me. That'd be. Fun. I think after after like we should listen to that together, uh, to that and 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 talk okay. about it. Let's do All it. Right. All right, great I got American. It. Great to see you, man. Time. You're Thank a great you American. Bye. Bye. How are you right. feeling about the midterms, well, Rachel? That was sad, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm a nervous Nelly. Um, I live with like a super optimistic person, so <laughs> I feel like I have to like you know be the negative Nancy, um, the realist. But yeah, I think it's. Um, I question the polling as well, and I question. So I mean, this has been not a lot of primaries. Mandela 
ended up not being, um, he ran unopposed. So in the end, so, so I guess when the real campaigning starts and the marketing and the messaging and the targeting, then you have to see where people are. And that, uh, I don't know. So I don't really believe the polls out of Florida, Ohio, maybe, um, you know, perhaps, but, um, I, I think it's still a lot of work to do, but I'm not total doomsday about it. I think it's possible. Um, but in the house, I don't see any, anything other than the Republicans winning. What do you guys think? What do you think, GDF? I am, I'm very concerned because I feel that one of the biggest issues and one of the best assets for perhaps the 2024 election is also the biggest liability in the 2022 election. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the, because there are so many investigations into the former guy, you have a lot of messaging about how he's a victim and there's not a lot of understanding over what court case is associated with what. And so it just seems like a conspiracy because people don't un understand the differences in each case. So you'll hear people say, well, but why is the Justice Department involved in this case? And how come he's in Manhattan answering questions on it? Like, mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of confusion. And because that provides some cover for actual substance with the confusion, you can get a good soundbite. And that could help later hurt now. And that's how I feel. How about you, Ben? So I have been a skeptic of the conventional wisdom on this election since around this time last year. And um, I don't believe that the Democrats are in as big a hole as they are reputed to be for the following two reasons. Um, one is that uh, crazy does not play that well in a general election. And the Republicans are on a very consistent basis selecting insane candidates. Um, mm -hmm. And that actually makes it hard to win general elections, um, particularly in swing areas. And then the second reason is that I, I did, as most people did, expect the Supreme Court to overturn Roe. And I do think that frames, uh, no pun intended, frames a choice election, uh, you know, in exactly the fashion that you don't want if you're mm -hmm. the out party. And, and I think that there is, um, you know, if you ask people to vote on how much do you like Joe Biden, uh, Republicans are gonna pick up a bunch of seats. But if you ask them, do you wanna vote for this crazy person so that he can take away your abortion rights? Um, that's a very different question. And the question is, to me, mm -hmm. I, I suspect is which is the salient question for the most voters in the fall. And I've always suspected that the answer is the the second question is actually going to be the, the salient question. Um, and I think that the um, like the more stories there are about, you know, in Ohio, the 10 year old or uh, in Florida, the 16 year old who have the state appellate court ruled is not mature enough to make this decision, so has to have a child. The more of those decisions there are, the more people are just going to see the prospect of the crazy election denier on their ballot as an, you know, who will accentuate this as an attractive vote, I, I think is going to decline. And so I, mm -hmm. I've i always been suspicious of the conventional wisdom of this on this. I remain suspicious of it. And uh, I, I don't know at what level I think de Democrats are likely to overperform, but I think w whatever the level of expectation in the CW, I expect Democrats to do better than that. Um, so I would say 
I, I would say I'd be surprised if Republicans took the Senate, and I would mm -hmm. not be surprised if Democrats held the House. But I'm in the extreme minority on this, and and um, and I'm, uh, you know, not remotely certain that I'm. I'm not remotely confident of my view. It's just an instinct. Well, I hope you're right. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to ask a couple of the questions from our question section, uh, just very briefly. So the number one question that I have is, what breed is Loki puppy? <laughs> he is a mini golden doodle. Oh, forever puppy. Yeah, okay. this is it's it's very high maintenance. I I understand that he's kind of a a therapy dog for our 11 year old, which is why we did this. We are so I know it's. It's ridiculous. We fully acknowledge this. We Not wanted ridiculous. a specific. No, it's awesome. We wanted a specific kind of dog. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then, a concerned citizen wrote to us. It's genuinely weird living in today's America, where the information saturation has drowned out shared facts that were important for public disclosure and collective decision making. How should people be waking up? What are the new norms that are appropriate for this world? And I would like to focus on the norms question. What do you guys think the new norm should be? Don't be an asshole. <laughs> great norm. Talk to I your just, neighbors. Talk yeah, to I people. Think, Stop. Another great norm. Yeah, I think like, you know, but but this is interesting because there was some polling that I saw or a poll that was like nine upwards of 90% of people are happy with their schools and their teachers, but then they think other teachers at <laughs> other schools are the problem. But this is everywhere. My neighborhood's okay. My community is all right. But did you hear what's happening somewhere else where they've never been? They don't know anyone who lives there. And they, you know, so this is like, don't do that. And, and, and I think that um, that kind of othering and, and you just have to have conversations so that you can dispel that as much as possible. That's why I always tell, say that I go to Oklahoma, um, you know, or whatever, just like, it's not, it's not that bad. Um, and there are reasonable people there too. So don't, don't write off a whole state or a whole area because, you know, but you got to talk to people. All right. Well, I think we're going to leave it there because we're going to end on time today because I have the power. No, it's wow. very, very dangerous. But we're going to just say that our norms and our takeaways for the show, everyone, are don't be an asshole and talk to your mm -hmm. neighbors. Yeah. And don't be an asshole while you talk to your neighbors. Yes, I think that's really yeah, important. The, 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 the intersection of yeah. those two uh -huh, norms is, uh -huh. is important. Yeah. Highly important. Rachel Vindman, you are a great American. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on today. Oh, thank you really for having me. This it. was a, a fun surprise and trying to waste away, sorry, not waste away my week, but kind of, I'm a little anxious <laughs> with my husband in Ukraine. So um, this is a, a fun, a fun afternoon surprise. Understand. We will do it again soon. Okay. We will be back two days from now. Mm -hmm. 47 hours and two minutes <laughs> from now. And until then, GDF? We do not have fun anymore. But in lieu of fun, we have puppies and optimism and respectful dis a, a respect of every individual's personal space, whether or not they are an animal person or <laughs> yes. not, because mm -hmm. that is important. Mm -hmm. So don't be an asshole and talk to your neighbors. <laughs>